it is absolutely against the rules of Scientology to contact the authorities and the police. If you understand this, then you know that there was no delay in reporting. The crimes were reported as the Scientologists, the victims, thought that they were required to do and that they had no other option. And part of the reason that these Jane Doe's didn't want to speak out was the fear of retaliation, as you mentioned. Scientology makes it terrifying for a victim to report a crime. Speaking of retaliation, did you notice anything right after you testified? Actually, starting in January and February of this year, Scientology and Office of Special Affairs has dramatically stepped up their attempts to destroy Mark and I going after Mark's clients, going after my clients, running their whole hate campaign on Twitter. Mm -hmm. A Scientologist will lie to protect Scientology. Hey, my name is Shalise Anzola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see all three of our faces today, go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like, you can subscribe. We are so close to 100K. We're so excited with how many people are willing to support the cause and be advocates for these people coming on and sharing their stories. Also, we love to hear from you in the comments. If you have any suggestions for people you want to see on the show, definitely definitely let us know. So today's guest, she's been on a few times. She's awesome. She's great. She is one of the highest ranking Scientology. We call them defectors with a little wink. She left when with her husband, Mark Headley. They have their own channel called Blown for Good, and she is incredibly important in today's episode. So I'm just going to get right into it. Bring her on. Thank you so much for joining us, Claire. Thank you so much for having me back. I appreciate it. Yeah. And also, you guys probably noticed I'm in a different studio. I'm actually five feet away from my normal one. But I'm on this side of the room today because I'm joined by my lovely husband and co-producer, Jonathan. Hello. I'm here. Yeah, I <laughs> wanted to jump on this one. Claire, we wanted to have you on to talk about this trial. You were an expert witness in this case, but you couldn't speak up about it. Right. Finally, the news broke yesterday on this actual sentencing. So we mad dashed to get you on so that we could talk about your experience with the trial. So here I am because I've got some (laughs) questions for you as well. Perfect. I'm looking forward to our, our discussion today. Yeah, we have a lot to get into. So if you're just joining and you have no idea anything about the case, a little bit of a rundown. I'm going to do my best and then I'm going to throw it to Claire for the details that I've missed. But Danny Masterson is a Scientologist who was just convicted and sentenced to life in prison for, I can't say the R word this early in a YouTube video, essaying um, three different women. Actually, two were only charged. One, it was a hung jury and they couldn't uh, decide on that. So he was charged with two counts and he will be facing life in prison with 30 years parole. So we're going to go into the details as to why Scientology is important for those of you who are like, why do you got to bring religion into this? Well, it was actually a huge factor and Claire was a huge factor in the trial as well. And we think it really showed the psychology of the women who were waiting really to come forward to police because of the beliefs within Scientology. And we're going to get into all of the different reasons why Claire was brought on as an expert witness. So Claire, did I miss any details on that little overview? Nope. I think you covered that summary very well. Okay, great. And just to add to that, we did go live with Claire. Well, yesterday when this video comes out, we did kind of give an overview of the entire um, sentencing. But as we said, we're going to get into the weeds here with what uh, Claire testified on or about. That said, one of the things that I was curious about was the involvement of the jury and their knowledge of Scientology, understanding Scientology. So, Claire, how do you think Scientology was... Uh, reflected in this case? Do you think that the jury kind of understood? And and, and is, is this why exactly why they brought you in to kind of provide the context? Yes, it very definitely um, 
it's my understanding that there was evidence and reports, um, some reports, not all the reports by any stretch of the imagination, but in any situation in Scientology, there is always extensive documentation and there's extensive language that's um, very difficult to understand if you don't understand positions in Scientology, roles in Scientology, beliefs in Scientology. It's just, but it's very specific, not to the beliefs per se, but the policies and procedures and how the organization deals with crimes. Obviously, in this case, it was very um, relevant and important that the jury understand the inner workings of what evidence and testimony that they were hearing. Um, for that context, that's where it was critical, um, at least as it was presented to me, that certain terms and I, concepts and so forth be defined and clearly laid out for the jury. Right. And or there was a trial before this trial. Scientology did not play as crucial of a role in. Well, yes. Actually, in the first trial, um, the judge had uh, laid out a stipulation that Scientology could not be mentioned at all. Um, so it was completely not, not a part of um, anything that the jury was allowed to factor in. And the reason for that is because there was, at least my understanding, again, I'm, I'm no lawyer. I was born in a cult, um, <laughs> spent 30, 30 years in Scientology. As I outlined, um, in my, in my presentation that I submitted to the court, I've studied Scientology in excess of 10,000 hours. So mm -hmm. that's the, uh, you know, I don't have a high school diploma. I don't have a college degree, but, Believe you me, I've studied Scientology policy and, um, you know, directives and so on and so forth ad nauseum for extensively. So there you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And in this trial, they had specifically written the things that they wanted you to speak about. So if you think this is the best way to do it, maybe we could just go through each point and maybe talk about, I know um, it, we don't have a ton of time, we have a, an hour or so, but we can go through each point and how you were able to address the concerns of the jury. Yes, absolutely. So first of all, um, I was asked to define Scientology in my testimony. Well, actually, I'm sorry. Let's just back up for a moment. So, um, so I was asked to, te to testify originally in September prior to the first trial. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the judge opted to not have anything relating to Scientology brought in because there was no, um, the defense was not contending that the events took place, but were taking different legal strategies on um, their approach. That, that then changed and they started to um, imply or infer that the, that the, the events didn't even take place. And that's where, you know, the extensive documentation that even was available to the prosecution um, came into play and had to be explained to, to document that the crimes were perpetrated and they were reported to Scientology. So this, this whole thing started in September of last year. And as I said, then I was informed uh, I was not going to be testifying. Then it, that trial ended in a hung jury and um, the prosecution um, opted to retry the case. Um, and so I was informed in March that yes, this time I would be testifying. In that same conversation where I was informed of that, I was also informed the defense had said that they were going to um, have an expert, expert witness as well, which was none other than my stepfather. <gasps> no. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, that was a that was a twist and turn and honestly and frankly, I think that was none other than an attempt to uh, you know, get in my head. <laughs> Discredit you too, probably. It just goes to show you, you know, I uh, on reflection, I'm like, so you destroyed my family and I my stepfather has done hate videos against me on your site. And now you expect this to have some kind of impact on me that I'm not, right. you know, to, to try and waver, I guess. I'm, I don't even, I can't even tell you what the intent was, but there's no question it was not a good one. So, so yeah, 
<laughs> so just just as an element, you know, it was if anyone questions was Scientology involved in this trial, to me that kind of epitomizes as one example of many ways in which they were very definitely involved. Right. Um, not to mention the fact that my stepfather signed over guardianship of me when I was 16 years old and never even knew he was not even allowed to physically know where I worked for the 14 years that I was at the headquarters because what? that's a confidential location. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to get too into the weeds with this, but I do think it's important to mention that based on the Scientology being involved in the case thing, they were sending people to intimidate witnesses. They had to be removed from the court at some point. They had their their version of bloggers, the, the people that write the hate websites in the courtroom there. And it was just very clear that they had their sticky little fingers in every little part of the process. Right. Yes. Yes, um, exactly. So, um, but to get to what I was required to testify about, first of all, I was just asked to define Scientology. And in very broad terms, I explained it as an applied philosophy that members uh, use in every aspect of their life. And I think that's important to understand because if you consider an actual religion um, and your interaction with that actual religion, you know, you you wouldn't expect that um, every aspect, your work, your friends, your kids, your, you know, your family would all be so deeply controlled by that religion. Some, you know, like for example, here in Colorado, people go to church on Sunday, you know, that's their involvement. It's very, mm -hmm. very different in Scientology. You use it in every aspect of your life, your business, your family, your relationship, uh, a civilian Scientologist is required to study Scientology 12 and a half hours per week at the minimum. So, you know, it's, it's just very, most Scientologists are very involved. The requirements are very, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a full-time commitment. Let's put it that way. And, and then, and then on top of that, you add the elements of the reporting, you know, the, 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 um, culture of knowledge reports in Scientology and knowledge report is something that any Scientologist is required to write and document and submit to their Scientology's police department, which is referred to as the ethics department. The ethics officer is the Scientology police officer. Um, so if anybody, for example, says, oh, something bad about Scientology or somebody did something that, that they is against Scientology directives, then they're required to write knowledge reports. Knowledge reports is a key element within Scientology when it comes to reporting amongst members, even amongst family. It's an expected activity of a Scientologist. And that, that is key. That's another key element that I was required to define and explain. How do knowledge reports work? Well, if a Scient if one Scientologist perpetrates a crime against another Scientologist, what happens? The victim is required to write a knowledge report and submit it to the Scientology police officer known as the ethics officer and is required to um, send copies of that report to, for example, Office of Special Affairs, which is the uh, fair game wing of Scientology and deals with all legal and public relations matters relating to Scientology, as well as Religious Technology Center. Religious Technology Center is the highest ecclesiastical organization in the Scientology structure run directly by David Miscavige. And that's the organization that I was, I worked for, for eight years in the time that I was a member of the C organization, the paramilitary organization whose members are required to sign a billion year contract. And so for four of the years that I was in Religious Technology Center, um, the position I held was technically number three on their org chart. So wow. I reported to Marty Rathbun, who reported to David Miscavige. She was up there, guys. <laughs> yeah. Claire, as a, as a quick little sidebar, I'm really curious. I kind of want to get in your head a little bit. So you're asked to testify. You're on the stand. How are you feeling at this point? Are you nervous? You're seeing some familiar faces on both sides. Is this, is this a moment where you feel like this is for vindication? It's a lot your, of pressure. Your whole life has led you to this moment. How are you feeling? <laughs> it was hard. It was tough. Uh, you know, there was no, uh, there was never a question in my mind that it was the right thing to do, but I also 
you know, sometimes you have to do hard things and it's not easy when you know it's you're going up against this billion dollar cult, even even though I've been speaking about my experiences in Scientology um, for about 16 years now, it never gets easy. Um, and it certainly isn't even rewarding, frankly. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it, it's, well, it's, it's helpful to know that we're helping other people. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, it's a lot of years, uh, 30 years of my life that I spent in a destructive cult that completely destroyed my family. And I was um, very, very high up and very involved to the point that I thought that I wouldn't be able to get out of that. Um, so I think it's important uh, and critical. And in this case, the facts and elements were just really important to outline and define how this organization was involved. Because, you know, the, as I mentioned, the reports and defining those reports and understanding the mechanisms and the handlings and uh, the Scientology gag order, for example, you know, all of these were elements that it was really critical for the jury to understand. Yeah. And that's a lot of pressure for you to be under to explain these in a concise way that the jury can understand in layman's terms so that nobody's lost and it doesn't go over their head. And I wasn't there, but according to Aaron, Aaron Smith-11 from Growing Up in Scientology, we followed his entire coverage. Guys, it's amazing. If you want to go check it out, it's like 13 hours of coverage because he was in the courtroom. According to him, you did an incredible job and yeah. everyone seemed to really take in all the information that you were saying. So let's get right into it. The first one was explaining the delay lay as to why it took the victim so long to go to the police. So do you want to get into that one? Yes. So first and foremost, there was no delay in reporting because in accordance with Scientology policies, the victims reported the crimes to Scientology. Right. Um, it's 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 hard to explain the level of indoctrination when it comes to a Scientologist and their absolute refusal to contact law enforcement. Um, I think it's important to outline that, at, you know, as I mentioned, I was in Religious Technology Center. That organization has a, a, a whole detailed listing. It's probably hundreds of items that are, quote, matters of RTC concern. And those are things that mean that Religious Technology Center will step in and get involved with those items. And just as um, an example, two matters of RTC concern that I would like to highlight. One, public statements against Scientology or Scientologists, but not to committees of evidence duly convened. So a committee of evidence is essentially Scientology justice, where a, a panel is assigned of, of people and they look at the facts and find somebody guilty or not guilty of charges. Uh, number two is civil s suits brought against a Scientology organization or Scientologist without first calling the matter to the attention of the international justice chief and receiving a reply. There are thousands of policies in Scientology. This is just, again, one example, but it is absolutely against the rules of Scientology to contact the authorities and the police. So Number one, as I said, it's important to understand this because if you understand this, then you know that there was no delay in reporting. The crimes were reported as the Scientologists, the victims, thought that they were required to do and that they had no other option. Right. right. In fact, these reports, that was kind of the downfall, right? That was a big, it was crucial to the case because they were able to go back and review these. Yes. And again, uh, Leah Remini posted on her Substack. Um, a letter that Jane Doe One's mother sent to David Miscavige in which um, she was demanding justice for the crimes perpetrated against her daughter. You know, there's there's so many pieces and elements of this case that involved Scientology. And that's where I have always felt that um, it's just important to know the, the mechanics of what goes on in Scientology when it comes to crimes committed, because this is not an isolated instance. It is their pattern and policy and procedure and how they deal with these things. And one thing that I'd love for you to cover um, as we move through this is those reports are somewhat cryptic in a way because of the certain code that was put in place to take out trigger words 
like the R word, which we can't say because of YouTube. Um, so can you go into the policies that Hubbard put into place to kind of distill down or water down these reports and why basically the defense was trying to say, well, they didn't say that that happened, but it's because of this code, right? Yes. So in my testimony, I covered the fact that starting in um, 1997, a code was implemented to remove any sensitive terms from any reports in Scientology, um, such as the R word, SA, um, psychotic break, things, uh, you know, um, unaliving other terms that were of a sensitive nature when it came to protecting Scientology and particularly protecting Scientologists and Scientology's, Scientology's involvement in those whatever that was being covered in the report. Mm -hmm. And the reason that code was implemented, it was implemented by David and Shelley Miscavige in response to reports that had been sent to Religious Technology Center and to Office of Special Affairs regarding the wrongful death of Lisa McPherson at the Fort Harrison in Clearwater, Florida in December 1995, where she was held after um, having a psychotic break. And um, anyway, that's a that's a tragic, yeah. tragic loss of life that should not have mm -hmm. happened. But that's what that's what triggered this code to go in to go into play. And thereafter, sensitive words would not be used in the reports being sent. Um, Scientology has uh, what they call 10G fax machines. They're called 10G because they cost 10 Gs at the time. <gasps> um, but every major facility had a 10G machine and the reports would be sent by fax. So for example, a report from AOLA or Advanced Organization Los Angeles at the blue, big blue buildings in Los Angeles, if, if a report needed to be made and that detailed a crime that had been committed, that would be sent on that secure fax line to Religious Technology Center, to the Office of Special Affairs. It would obviously go into um, the involved parties, ethics folders, their counseling folders. You know, Scientology is very, very good at documenting um, extensively but as as has been testified to in the past as well, and, and specifically in the case of Lisa McPherson, when there was criminal case pending, reports were destroyed. Wow, they just yeah. straight up destroyed the evidence. To protect Scientology, yeah. Wow. I wanna add too about the, the, the wording being changed, how crucial that is in this particular case, because as far as your, your involvement as an expert witness, so Shalise and I were there for one of the days for the closing statements. I think it went two days. Uh, so we were we kind of caught the, the energy of the room and, and heard the defense's case. Um, we also saw all of Aaron in growing up in Scientology's coverage, again, amazing coverage, where we pretty much understood that the defense's case was built on semantics. Mm -hmm. And well, if they said this, and this is a lie, maybe everything they said is a lie. And if everything they said is a lie, maybe everything everyone is saying, all the Jane Doe's are lying. It was just mind boggling. So, but that just goes to show that if this is their case semantics, and the these reports are kind of built on semantics, that's just how important your role of coming in to clarify and contextualize everything was, is. <laughs> to clarify. Oh, I'm usually the one with the puns over I know, here. You're <laughs> a lot of people have started saying that they're like thank you for the clarification oh my gosh oh man i'm late to the, yeah. the joke <laughs> it was there yeah no you're absolutely right and um yeah also uh, so some of the other pieces that i testified to even is that in Scientology, there's uh, an emotional tone scale that was written by L. Ron Hubbard. It, it runs from minus 40 all the way up to 40. And where this came into play is in relation to the term victim. A Scientologist will never refer to themselves as a victim. And the reason being is because, um, so like I said, this emotional tone scale, minus 40 to 40 at the you know, and the whole goal of Scientology is to move somebody up this emotional tone scale. And if you're above 2.0 on this tone scale, then you're surviving, you're doing better, you're, you're um, improving in life. And if you're below 2.0, 
which 2.0 is anger, then you're succumbing and moving towards death. And that's obviously a negative thing in Scientology Mm -hmm. and in life, frankly. Um, But victim on that tone scale is 0.1, just above body death. And so it's really important to know that the indoctrination in Scientology, especially when you're born and raised in it, is such that you will never uh, refer to yourself as a victim ever. In fact, um, you know, it's, it's become almost even a slur, um, in Scientology. Like people will say, stop being a victim, you know, like it's a negative. But the fact is there are victims in Scientology of crimes. And unfortunately, the language is laden with, um, terms and mechanisms that make somebody then believe that they did, they did something wrong to pull this in. So another term I had Mm -hmm. to explain is overt motivator sequence, which in Scientology in just very simple terms is the concept that if something is done to you, you've, you've done something prior to that. You committed a crime that resulted in that being the, you being worthy of that crime. Wow. Victim blaming. Yes, precisely. That's right. So, and it's not, it's not optional. It's 100% of the time, always the case, whether whatever crime you're accusing somebody of, you've done that crime, whether in this lifetime or in earlier lifetimes. Um, And you will be interrogated to find out what crime you committed that made you worthy of being the victim of what you're accusing someone of. That's awful. So were these ethics officers, the ones that took the reports at the time and then and kind of uh, put it under wraps, the whole thing, are, are they being sued or are, are the Jane Doe's able to do anything about them? I certainly hope so. I don't know. I honestly don't know the status of it, but I know that Julian Schwartz was an ethics officer that has covered up a lot of crimes. Um, this is just one example that I believe he was involved in. Um, so we'll see. We'll, you know, time will tell what, with the civil case where that leads to. But mm-hmm. yeah, there, there's many people in Scientology that have answering to do. Um, you know, the, Yes, this is the policy of Scientology, but there's also individuals who enabled criminals to get away with said crimes. Yeah. And because you really understand the mentality, having been in for 30 years and left and, you know, hindsight is 2020, are you able to kind of speculate as to the mindset of the victims, how they must have felt coming forward and being interrogated for their, quote, crimes that they committed I'm trying to understand what they must have felt like if they even considered telling the ethics officers at all because they knew that they would be punished for it. Can you speak to that right. a little bit? Yes, no, absolutely. There is no question that the Jane Doe's are just incredibly courageous. Um, you know, I can't even imagine. I Well, I can't imagine. I know how terrifying it would have been to, first of all, make that report to the, mm-hmm. the Scientology police. But then subsequently to take that step of going to the actual police, um, having been, you know, to my knowledge, at least one of the Jane Doe's was born and raised in Scientology when that's the only life you've ever known to to take that step is just so so incredibly brave and courageous, Mm -hmm. knowing full well that fair game is a practice in Scientology covered by thousands of policy letters that mandates that anyone who takes that step and doesn't follow Scientology's directives, doesn't do what they say, doesn't stay under their control, but steps out of that boundary, can now be attacked, destroyed, lied to, you name it, on and on. It's it's right. ruthless and vicious. And so there's no question that that would be absolutely a terrifying step to, to take to pursue justice. It was, and at right. great cost, great personal cost. And on top of that, so they're, they're testifying, they're recounting these traumatic events of their life. And then you have Scientology there in the courtroom that's intimidating them in various ways on top of all of that. Yes, completely. In fact, it's my understanding that Jane Doe 1 in her victim impact statement called out uh, Graham Brewer, who is a Scientologist right. who was in the courtroom, who had um, committed, perpetrated a crime against her when she was a minor. Right. And he was there in the courtroom 
to, you know, I mean, you just can't, the intentional inf infliction of emotional distress in that one example is just horrifying. Right. While Masterson is there too. So she has two of her perpetrators. abuse her perpetrators there in the room, just feet away as she's recounting these, these traumatic events. Yeah. Absolutely grueling. The Jane Doe's to go through not just one trial, but two of grueling testimony, cross-examination, all of that. I mean, they are completely the heroes in this case, and their persistence and courage and bravery is mind-blowing. Absolutely, especially understanding what I know now, what you just explained about how they were interrogated within Scientology before they even went to the police and how terrifying that must have been. And yes. part of your expert testimony was to explain to the jury why they would have delayed going to the actual police. And you have some quotes by Hubbard that I would love for you to share to kind of give more context as to why that was an absolute no within Scientology. Yes, absolutely. And before I get to those, one of the pieces that I included in my testimony is the fact that in Scientology, there's a computerized system called source information retrieval that's referred to as SIR. In, in, and that, that computerized system contains thousands and thousands and thousands of Hubbard directives on all different topics. And so, for example, in the time that I was in Religious Technology Center, I had access to the the advices and writings of Hubbard relating to Religious Technology Center that people in lower organizations would not have access to. And the mm -hmm. reason I bring bring that up and the reason I brought it up in my testimony, first of all, is was to outline that in naming my stepfather as their expert witness, it was important to include information because he was only ever a civilian Scientologist. Mm. He was never a member of the C organization. He never worked in Religious Technology Center. He never had access to that database. Anyway, yeah. but, and, but also the other reason I'm bringing it up now is because it's important to understand that the, the policies I'm reading is just a smattering of what I currently have access to. There are many other writings, even more, um, damning and specific that outline the mistrust of government agencies. You know, I mean, let's not forget that Scientology in 1977 was raided by the FBI and found guilty of the biggest infiltration of the U.S. government in its history. Jeez. Just Google Operation Snow White to learn all about that. You know, 12... Uh, co-conspirators uh, ended up in jail, including Mary Sue Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard's wife. What? Whoa. But not Hubbard yeah. himself, unfortunately. No. Like he was dead. But Hubbard was then on the run for the rest of his life. Oh, uh, so. is that, that's why he, <laughs> hold on, I'm putting the pieces together. Isn't that why he created the actual Sea Org cruise ship so that he could just be on international waters and never port, like dock? Somewhere that they yes. could arrest him. <laughs> yes. Look at me putting things wow. together. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> we actually know a thing or two about Scientology over here. <laughs> I'm learning. <Yeah. laughs> okay, so you yes. were going to talk about the the reason why going to the police is a no, according to Hubbard. Yes. And so, for example, um, so one quote is from a, a policy called Keeping Scientology Working Series 1. And this is a policy that every single Scientologist reads at the start of every single training that they ever do. And L. Ron Hubbard said, we're not playing some minor game in Scientology. It isn't cute or something to do for lack of something better. The whole agonized future of this planet, every man, woman, and child on it, and your own destiny for the next endless trillions of years depend on what you Yikes. do here and now with and in Scientology. This is a deadly serious activity. And if we miss getting out of the trap now, we may never again have another chance. And so again, that quote is so is to make very clear. It's not an it's not in Scientology. It's not, oh, let me interpret what this means. It's no, you follow L. Ron Hubbard policy to the letter, and your life depends on it. Yeah, the fact that he called it deadly is like, yeah, he, he got one thing right. 
Yes, exactly. And so then another element was that um, there are suppressive acts outlined by L. Ron Hubbard in Scientology. And if you commit a suppressive act, then you can um, be fair gamed, you can receive a committee of evidence, you can be expelled, and then you're subject to fair game and you're um, completely open to them doing that practice of doing whatever they need to, to viciously attack and destroy you. Um, mm -hmm. And so some of those, here's another quote from L. Ron Hubbard from offenses and penalties, such suppressive acts include public disavowal of Scientology or Scientologists in good standing with Scientology organizations, public statements against Scientology or Scientologists, but not to committees of evidence duly con convened, testifying as a hostile witness against Scientology in public. And so again, you know, um, there is an, uh, so another piece of my testimony related to, um, again, to knowledge reports and what gets done with those knowledge reports. And specifically in Scientology, there's policy that says if somebody is a, is in good standing, uh, and what does that mean? What does good standing mean? Well, that means you're a Scientologist that um, does everything that you're supposed to do. You're upstat, meaning you're you're promoting Scientology, you're donating to Scientology, you're attending Scientology training. If you're in good standing, there's a an L. Ron Hubbard policy that says that any reports written on you should be quote filed with a yawn unquote. So that was another concept that I had to explain in terms of what happens with knowledge reports when they are submitted, particularly with somebody who is considered to be a Scientologist in good standing. Mm -hmm. And isn't it true that if that Scientologist in good standing were to suddenly do something against Scientology, they're all of a sudden not in good standing, and now they have to dig up all of the things that were against them, that there was no action taken because they were in good standing, is that right? Um, not exactly, no. But but yes, Scientology will then use whatever information to then destroy that person if they if they've if they're guilty of having committed a suppressive act, for example, mm. speaking to a, a police officer and reporting a crime. Actually, this is very interesting. I want your opinion on this. So, if, for example, Danny Masterson accepts his fate. He goes to prison and all of a sudden he speaks out and he's like, yeah, Scientology is the worst. They were abusing me. They were forcing me to keep quiet, blah, 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 blah. What do you think Scientology would do in retaliation to Danny? That's a great question. Um, because, yes, they would retaliate. But yet, honestly, it seems that that would be the only logical step because Scientology has been enabling criminals and letting criminals get away with committing crimes and then not reporting them to the police. So that would be interesting. Um, but I think that Scientology will go to very great lengths to prevent that from happening. Yeah. Speaking of retaliation, did you notice anything right after you testified? I know they have their ways of following people that you guys have, you and Mark have a hate website about you. Did you notice any anything else brewing after you testified? Um, that's a good question. I, I kept my nose down and kept out of, you know, I was just like, you know, um, you got to stay super focused here. So I, I, I was expecting, uh, nonsense and distraction. Um, I can't say I, I noticed anything particularly more or less than has already been going on. I mean, obviously, since actually starting in January and February of this year, they've, Scientology and Office of Special Affairs has dramatically stepped up their attempts to destroy Mark and I going after Mark's clients, going after Whoa. my clients, running their whole hate campaign on Twitter. Um, so I wouldn't say anything more than usual per se, um, but also I was obviously being very careful. Yeah. Wow. And part of the reason that these Jane Doe's didn't want to speak out was the fear of retaliation, as you mentioned. Do you know anything specific that happened to them? I'm seeming to remember something about their pets. Was that yes. the same case? So sad. Yeah, I believe that that's outlined in the civil case. And I think um, there's many examples of it in the civil case. But yeah, and again, you know, it's it's absolute Scientology makes it terrifying for a victim to report a crime and then 
um, if like in this case, the Jane Doe's did end up going to the police and um, what they've done since then. I mean, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll see the evidence and documentation and so on and so forth. And I certainly have experienced many examples as well. I mean, they, they've been targeting Mark and I heavily since 2006. Yeah. Wow. And for those who don't know, they, the Jane Doe's pets all mysteriously passed away and they think it was poison. And that is just so low and disgusting and awful. And I can't believe anyone would feel okay with themselves doing something like that. And Claire, maybe you can speak to this, but I think it has to do with the greater good being Scientology. So anything is quote fair game, as long as Scientology comes out on top. Is that true? Yes, absolutely. Mark, Mark, uh, in the interview you did with Mark, where he talked about fair game, he outlined their policy, which uh, one of the policies that is part of the practice of fair game is if you are trying to, uh, Scientology will try to silence and muzzle someone. That's even terms used by Hubbard. Um, and how you do that is by finding out what they love, going after that, find out what they hate, make more of that. Um, you know, it, it's vicious and brutal. It really is. It's, uh, you know, it's just not, it's, it's hard to believe the levels they will go to until you actually experience it directly. Um, for me personally, that, that, it, that flip and experience of, you know, this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde moment really hit me during our lawsuit, um, mm-hmm. where in deposition, they were just so vicious and brutal. And, you know, uh, again, I was born into Scientology is was never my choice. Um, and I, you know, was indoctrinated and raised to believe that Scientology was working to save the planet and help right. people and this yeah. and that. And then to, re- to experience the flip side of that, where they're viciously trying to destroy you, it is eye opening. Hmm. Yeah, the amount of betrayal. Yeah. Because already when you leave a cult or a high demand group, there's so much to unpack when you realize that you've been lied to your whole life or you've been manipulated and controlled. So there's already that where you feel ashamed and guilty for falling for something or believing in something. And then when the group flips on you, when your family flips on you and you're dealing with actual people who you thought loved and cared for you and you're realizing that wasn't unconditional love, that was very conditional love and it's shocking. And the same thing happens with Mormonism. People in, I get people in the comments that are like, that's not our church. They're loving and kind. And I'm like, trust me, I get it. Cause I saw that side of them too. You don't see the flip side until you speak out against them. And then they send their lawyers to silence you or to pay you off or to excommunicate you and cut you off from your family and friends. And it really is staggering to kind of taken that information and accept it as reality when, like you said, you've been raised with an entirely different perspective of this group. Yes, that's exactly right. And unpacking the mechanisms of control and leverage is a a process to behold. You really have to um, kind of be be willing to dig in and, and, and understand and look at things from different perspectives. And to me, the control and leverage are the elements of those high control organizations where you just go, you know, <laughs> if, if they're not willing, if somebody, if an organization is not willing to let you speak your truth, get justice for a crime perpetrated against you, hold your family uh, against you, you really have to take a step back and evaluate what you're a part of. Right. And it's hard to do because it flips your entire world upside down. And just admitting the fact that they're not for you, they're against you is terrifying because it flips everything upside down. And you have to reevaluate every part of your life and every belief and every thought that you've been told to think and every action that you've been told to behave by. It's just really confusing and difficult. Yes. Yes. Do you completely. happen to know if these Jane Doe's have left Scientology or if they're still involved? Um, to my knowledge, they are. They were all involved and now are no longer. Okay. Wow, that's another level. Yeah. So, for example, and again, referencing Leah Remini's Substack and the letter from Jane Doe One's mother that she posted there, the significance of that letter is that the mother was fighting for Jane Doe One 
and trying to get justice for her. But again, she, the, the mother told Jane Doe one, I want justice for Danny Masterson for the crimes perpetrated against you, but not at the expense of my religion. Wow. And the mother has now disconnected from Jane Doe one and refused to testify in this trial. Wow, that's so awful. And I mentioned this in the live, but I want to mention it again, that it's just so heartbreaking when a religion comes between family and when you realize that these parents are prioritizing this group over their own child's safety, it's just hard to comprehend unless you've really been in a, a cult or a high control group because you are wired to put the group above everything else. Even if they tell you family is everything, even if they tell you relationships are everything, they always expect you to put the group before your family. Right. Completely. You have to judge a person in a high control organization by their actions, not what they say. Mm -hmm. A Scientologist will lie to protect Scientology. It is part of Hubbard policy. Um, they they practice it. They drill it. Um, you know, in any situation involving law enforcement, there people would be very carefully coached as to exactly what to say, person to person to person. Um, and it's happened many many times, unfortunately. So yeah, it's it's dangerous. So is there anything else that you wanted to speak to about the trial that you think was really important to the case and helping sentence Danny? Um, in summary, I would just again say um, my complete admiration and respect to the courage and bravery of the Jane Doe's. Um, I truly hope that other victims of Scientology will come forward as, and as I mentioned, already are. I know there are other victims out there. I know this is just one example because it is the practice and policy of Scientology to enable covering up crimes, to keep it all within the Scientology bubble. A Scientologist will choose Scientology policy and procedure over the laws of the United States of America any day of the week. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really important to understand that. Yeah, I agree. And while we're commending, Claire, thank you so much for your contribution to this case. And hopefully in the long run, taking down Scientology, we're just one yes. step closer to taking down cults, which is our, our mission. You, you're a legend. Everybody loves yes. you. And <laughs> your life has led you to, and, and you said earlier that you almost felt like it wasn't rewarding. But for, for us on the outside, something like what you did is very satisfying. And uh, I cannot applaud you enough. Yes. Well, I yeah. so appreciate it. You're going to make me cry. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I true I truly feel that um it was the I know it was the right thing to do. I will continue to do the right thing. Thank you both for your work as well um in helping speak people speak their truth, helping people understand the mechanics of high control organizations. And, you know, we'll just keep taking this one day at a time. Um, you know, I'm certainly not doing this for myself. So um I just hope that I can continue helping people by educating them. Yeah. And if I had a Linda Listen, it would be to Scientology and it would be a Linda Listen. Claire's coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> Linda uh, Listen. I, so when we did our first video, I hadn't seen the video of that little toddler. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Linda Listen. <laughs> so amazing. I love it. I was laughing so hard. Do you have a Linda Listen that you want to add to this episode? Oh, Linda Listen. You cannot get away with crimes. You can't, whether you're a cult, a high control organization, um, don't let people get away with crimes. Make the world a better place and help people to get better, for real. Um, using the justice system, the government agencies, using what has been put in place to protect the free world. Yes. Yes. I Amen. second that. Amen. Well, this has been incredible. Thank you so much, Claire, for coming on on such short notice. The news broke yesterday and I texted you and I was like, Claire, can we do this? <laughs> it is time. <laughs> it is time. Yeah. So we appreciate you coming on such short notice. Guys, if you haven't already, go check out Claire's channel with her husband, Mark, Blown for Good, where they just discuss everything Scientology, the inner workings. So good. And yeah, really good stuff. Really good stuff and Blown for Good. I'm just full of it today, guys. Um, <laughs> and you can check out their website, blownforgood.com. Com. Also, if you need help leaving Scientology, if you're watching this saying, I need support, I don't know how to do this, the Aftermath Foundation is a beautiful resource. Claire is the president of that. You can go to theaftermathfoundation.org, right? 
Yes. Yes. Okay, you can go to the aftermathfoundation.org to check that out. Also, if you want to volunteer for the Aftermath Foundation to help people who are trying to escape, you can do that as well through that website. And Blown for Good on Instagram and anything else that you want to shout out before we go, Claire? No, just thank you both for your time. Thank you for your invaluable work too. And thank you to everyone listening and watching. We appreciate it. And Hats off to the Jane Doe's as a final out. Yes. 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 Hats off to the Jane Doe's. And guys, if you have any words of encouragement or, you know, uh, statements of celebration, you can leave those in the comments below. It really helps us, helps the algorithm and shows that you're supporting the cause. And if you want to support even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. Our newest patrons, Siobhan, Kay, and Joel, thank you so much for your contributions. And if you like this video, we're definitely going to link some videos down below for you to check out next. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well and be well.